Hey there, HSM community. It is great to be with you all here this morning. Thanks for tuning in once again. We are still in our series, Inverted, where we have been exploring for the past couple of weeks and months the upside down way of gaining by losing. And this week, we, we kind of get, we're getting to the tail end a little bit of what Jesus is saying in the Beatitudes and the Sermon of the Mount. And so we're going to be focusing on Matthew 5, verse 10, which will be the last verse that we read today. But I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles right now to Matthew chapter 5. It's the first book in the New Testament. And we're going to read some of these verses together to kind of just get a context of where we've been and kind of where we are now. So let's read this together in Matthew 5, verse 2. It says this, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And this is our verse today. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, from the first beatitude to the last, there's kind of this bracket. And that's how we can know that, obviously, we've got some other sermons that we're going to be doing that, that, that follow up on the verses after this. But there's this kind of this bracket that's going on in, in, this, in the beatitudes where Jesus begins by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in our verse today, Matthew 5, 10, he says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Now, note, it says there, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so we kind of have this unit there that Jesus says, to live like this is to live the inverted, upside-down way of gaining by losing kind of life. And I'm sure that for some of you, you're like, wow, <laughs> I can handle the first couple Beatitudes, but this one is probably the most difficult pill to swallow of them all. Because in a way, it is. It's the, the, the one part of the Beatitudes that's in a way so foreign and so different from what we're used to hearing in God's Word. And so I want to kind of just give a small roadmap for where we're going to go in our sermon today. And I, I've done this because I think this would be the most helpful way for us to be able to understand, to grasp onto, and then to apply into our lives this whole idea of Christian persecution and what Matthew 5 verse 10 is saying. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define for us what persecution is from the Bible I'm also then going to share a story, a modern day story of what Christian persecution looks like. And then we're going to kind of ask the question, why is this so foreign to us? And how can we kind of begin to think through this more in our lives in such a way that we'd be people who are more faithful to the scriptures and who look more and more like Christ on a day to day basis. Okay, so let's read Matthew 5 verse 10 again. It says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so persecution has to do with righteousness. It has to do with Christians living out their Christian lives and people responding to that. And so our definition for persecution is this. Persecution is harmful actions done against Christians in response to the display of the righteousness of God. Persecution is harmful actions done against Christians in response to the display of the righteousness of God. And so persecution is, it's like hostility and war against God's own righteousness. We see the first occurrence of this as early on as Genesis 4 between Cain and Abel. Abel goes and makes a sacrifice to God. He gives of his first fruits and it's pleasing to God and God willingly and lovingly receives it. But Cain goes and he doesn't give of his first fruits. He just gives some kind of offering to God and God is not pleased. And when Cain hears that, he goes and he murders his brother Abel in the field. Why? Because Abel displayed the righteousness of God and Cain couldn't handle it. He didn't like it. He didn't like that he was being pointed out as a person who was unrighteous. And so Cain literally tried to kill the righteousness in Jesus as a way of stopping it. 
We see even in the New Testament where we see the martyr Stephen, the first Christian martyr in the early church. He was stoned to death in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60 for preaching and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ to, to all these people who were listening. Paul was even there as Saul. He held the cloaks of the people who were stoning him. And it's because Stephen was preaching the gospel of Jesus to these people that they did these harmful actions of killing him by stoning him in response to him displaying the righteousness of God. And so I want to give you a modern day story of a lady named Asia Noreen, or some of the people call her Asia Bibi, of, of Asia Noreen, who was and who experienced intense Christian persecution. Asia Noreen is from Pakistan. She now lives in Canada. But in June of 2009, Asya was out in the fields with some of her friends in Pakistan working, and she went in to go get a cup of water, and she began to take a cup of water from a bucket that her friend, that her friend had in her home, and her friends told her that she couldn't drink from that bucket of water, but because, because she was a Christian and because she was impure, because of believing in Jesus, she would like pervert and, and, and mess up and make their water bad. She disagreed with them and said, that's not true. And, and they said, well, uh, you know, Asya, you should just convert to Islam, you know, follow the prophet of Muhammad. And Asya disagreed. And she said, no, I, I, I don't believe in that. I believe in Christ. And she began to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And she began to speak against the prophet of Muhammad. Later on that day, when Asya went home, a group of people gathered around her home. They dragged her out and they beat her. And later on in the month of June of 2009, Asya was accused of blasphemy by the Pakistani government. And she was thrown in prison for sharing her faith with her friends. And eventually, about a year and a half later, in November of 2010, Asya was sentenced to death by hanging for the crime of blasphemy against the prophet of Muhammad. She spent the next eight years in prison away from her husband, and her four little children. And during this eight-year span, two different governing authorities in Pakistan tried to uh, get Asya freed from her imprisonment and get this, this sentence, this death sentence removed. And subsequently, those two governing authorities were assassinated for, what, for, for advocating for Asya. Even at one point, someone placed a hit of 500,000 rupees, which is the currency in Pakistan, that would be rewarded to the person who would kill Asya. It wasn't until October of 2018 that after years and years of praying uh, by the Christian community, including myself, I remember hearing about the story first in about 2013, um, she was acquitted. And the government said that they weren't going to execute her for, the blas- for, her, for, for this charge of blasphemy. And yet still, she was held in that prison cell until April of 2019. And then eventually, in May of 2019, just last year, May of 2019, last year, her and her family landed in Canada and had successfully escaped and the persecution that they were being under, and they endured the persecution they were under and made it to a place that was safe in Canada. Asya Noreen is a modern day example of what it means to be persecuted for sharing your faith in Jesus. And so as we hear the story, it's, it's terrifying, it's horrific to think of being beaten, being thrown in prison, to be on death row, to be separated from your, from, your, from your husband or your wife and your children. But in a way, I think if we're honest with ourselves, this story of Asya Noreen and Jesus' words in Matthew 5.10, that blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, these two ideas are pretty foreign to us. They're, they're, they're almost hardly relatable to us. And why is that? I I think one of the reasons why is because this kind of persecution, institutionalized governmental persecution uh, like Asya and Oreen experience is not typical in the Western world because we we have laws and some things to protect and uh, protect us against those things. And those things are gracious provisions by our governments. And an extent, I guess, except like that our, the, the persecution that maybe we would receive 
looks a little bit different than this. Our persecution is not so much physical, but it's verbal or it's discriminatory, where people are discriminating against us uh, or they're saying things badly about us or of us because we claim faith in Jesus. But I think probably the second and more important reason is because in the Western world, we, we kind of live in a world of comfort. We've been sold on this vision by, of life by the world that tries to get us to avoid difficulty and pain and suffering at all costs. You know, and, and, and in a way, you know, we, we look at what's going on in the world around us and, and, and it's, it's impossible to avoid that. But people say, just, just go with the stream. Just, 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 just believe everything that everyone else is believing. Don't, don't make ripples in the pond or whatever it may be. People are saying, don't, don't go against the tide. But yet what God calls us to here in this inverted life is to live a completely different kind of life than what the world is selling us. But yet the world, sometimes we still buy into what the world is offering us. We, we slip into this slippery slope of distraction where we just distract ourselves from the pain of the world by flipping the channel or curating our news feed or unfollowing the certain person because we don't want to hear their perspective or whatever it may be. Or even maybe we're just dumping hours into Netflix or into video games, which even I'm guilty of. of you know, or maybe we just go into ease or to comfort as a way of avoiding what's actually happening in the world around us or from escaping from the call that we know that Jesus has placed on our lives for us to follow him and to live a different kind of life. Sometimes we just become complacent or apathetic. We just don't care. And I don't say this as to call you out because I'm calling myself out as much as I'm calling everyone who's watching this out that that we need to examine our hearts and really ask the question, what do we stand to learn from what Matthew 5.10 has to say about the persecuted? And what do we have to, to learn from the story of Asya Noreen and other Christians who are persecuted around the world? And I think the lesson is this, and this is the main point of our sermon today, is that suffering and persecution sobers us up to what matters most. It sobers us up to what matters most. And so what I mean by that is that if, if you're drunk on something, you're inebriated. Your, your judgment is impaired. You can't focus. You can't operate all these things. But when you are sober, when you are clear-minded and clear, you can think well, you can operate, you can do all of these things. And what persecution and suffering does for us is that it wakes us up to the reality of what's going on in the world. And it especially wakes us up. If we're listening to what Jesus is saying, it wakes us up to the kind of life that Jesus is calling us to. He's, he's calling us to this life that we see in the Beatitudes where we're poor in spirit, where we mourn over our sin, where we're meek and humble people. We hunger and thirst for the things of God. We're merciful to other people, even at great cost to ourselves. We're pure in our hearts. We have a singular devotion. We are people of peace, not people of war. And what is this? What kind of response do we get for this? People don't like that. Why? because they don't understand it. They don't understand it and because they don't want to admit that they have a problem, just like often we don't want to admit that we have a problem. But this is the kind of life that God is calling us to, and it helps us to focus on what matters most. And so I think there's two things we need to learn before we focus on what matters the most. And, and, and the first thing is this. We need to learn that we should expect persecution and suffering. In John 15, 8 verse through 21, Jesus is talking to his disciples and essentially he says, if the world hates you, it's because they hated me. They hated me first. And we see that this happened because Jesus died on the cross, an innocent man beaten beyond recognition for us. But it was done because he displayed the righteousness of God. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, Paul says it in probably the clearest words in all of the New Testament. He says, indeed, all, not some, he says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's a promise. We will be persecuted if we desire to live a godly life. And so this is what we need to learn. Persecution is normal, and it is expected. If you are living out your Christian life, people are probably going to speak 
poorly of you. They're probably going to exclude you from some gathering. They're probably going to, to say mean things about you if you are living your faith out in a gracious and kind and Christ-loving way. And so we have to, what the temptation is then is for us to kind of slide into this life of ease and we have to not, we have to stay the course and place our faith in Christ. And so the second thing that we need to learn is that we should endure persecution and suffering. So, so, so in a way, how? how? How do we endure it? We endure it by seeing that persecution helps us to grow in our faith in Jesus. So James 1 verses 2 and 4 is very clear about this. He says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And so James here, the brother of Jesus, isn't saying, hey, you got to be super happy when, when life's going terribly and when people are saying terrible things about you. But he's saying we can count persecution and suffering joy because of what God is doing in it. And that we get to grow in our relationship with God. We get to grow in, in trusting God for his mercy and his grace and his love and his deliverance for his faithfulness. And in that, it tests our faith and it proves and it makes our faith, as 1 Peter 1 would say, to be proved to be worth more than gold, that we get to have this steadfastness. And what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Beatitudes is that he's calling us to what James refers to here is that, is that you would be perfect and complete, which means not perfect sinlessness, but it's this Greek idea called teleos, which means wholeness, where we are a people who are consistent. We are people who believe the same thing and live that out. We're not people who act one way and believe another thing. That's what a hypocrite is, but rather we are people who are perfect and complete. We are, full, we are filled fully with all that God is for us in Christ, and we live that out fully in, in how we live and love other people around the world. And when we are like that, we lack nothing because we have what matters the most. You see, persecution and difficulty and hardship are allowed by God in our lives so that our faith in Jesus would be deepened and we would grow deep roots into who God is, but also it's so that our love of the world, our enchantment with the trinkets of the world would be lessened and would fall away and that our desire and love for God would be dramatically increased by seeing that the only thing that matters in persecution and in suffering is that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is with us. And so what really matters then? What really matters? And this is our last point. Is that what really matters is the gospel. The gospel really matters. Loving God and loving other people. We see that Jesus came down to die for sinners. He was the persecuted one. He died an innocent man taking our punishment on himself so that we then, after he was denied by the Father and when he died and resurrected on the third day, that we could have hope and a new life and faith in him by what he has done for us. You see, Jesus was persecuted for our sake so that we could have a new life in him. And so this frames then what really matters. And so what really matters then is Jesus' greatest command, which is to love God with every atom of your being and to love others as God has loved you. You see, uh, obviously, we, 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 as the past couple, this last point here, we've, we've looked at and we've seen that God is drawing us closer in persecution and in suffering. He's growing us to, to have a greater love and faith in him. But then also we see that it makes its way in how we love others. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and listen, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You see, the way that persecution and suffering helps us to love other people is that when we learn to endure through difficult things and through trials, and we learn how to be comforted by God in that, we're learning that so we can give that to other people and so that we can learn how to comfort other people with the hope that we have in Jesus. We're able to give them a hope that is 
that is grounded and that is firm and that doesn't waver in the middle of a world that has no hope. And so in light of these things, I just want to clarify something for us and make sure that we can land this sermon in the right place in our hearts. And so I need to give a clarification on what persecution is and what it's going to look like for you and I as we, as, as we kind of live in this world that we're in. Persecution might be physical, meaning someone might physically hurt you because you believe in Jesus and because you're proclaiming the truth of Jesus. It also will probably most likely now be verbal and discriminatory, meaning that people will say things like, you're uneducated for believing that, or you're stupid or silly or, or whatever it is, or you're just, you're just a bigot or you're crude, whatever it may be. People will call you these names. They'll lie behind your back. They'll exclude you from gatherings and certain other things because they're trying to oppress and to push down the righteousness of God. But I also want to clarify what persecution is not, because we sometimes we get this wrong, okay? So persecution is not you being a Christian and having a particular political persuasion or stance. There's nowhere in the Bible where it says to be a Christian is to be Republican or to be Democrat or to be Libertarian, whatever it may be. And so if you're beating people over the head with your political stance and you're saying, oh, it's Christian persecution, no, it's not. It's simply not. But also, if you're a Christian and you're just rude to people, if you just like to speak the the truth without love, then you need to go back and re-examine the way that Jesus spoke to people. Because that's not persecution either. If you're just being rude to people about what you believe and 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 not being understanding of where they're at and being able to appreciate and understand them as a whole person who's also made in the image of God. That's not persecution either. And, and also being a Christian and, and, and maybe someone not liking you because you're self-righteous is probably a bigger statement about you than it is about them. And so we must grow in not being people who are self-righteous and who have these truth sticks that we're just beating other people over the head with and then them not liking us for it. That's, that's not persecution. That's just you being self-righteous. And I bring these up because all of these things, they come up in your life as well as they come up in my own. And I have to make sure that I'm displaying the proper righteousness of Jesus. And so, granted, there are some areas where things are moved into the political sphere that are things that we stand by, like the sanctity of the unborn and and the sanctity of human life. We will uphold that. Why? Because it's clearly declared in the Bible. And we uphold what the Bible says, and we defend the rights of the unborn but also in things like biblical sexuality and biblical marriage and gender roles. We humbly uh, submit ourselves to what the Bible says in Genesis 2, 24, that marriage is to be between one man and one woman for all for the rest of their lives. And so we humbly submit ourselves to that, that that is God's good and gracious design. And if we follow that command and, that, and we obey that, God has a flourishing and a wonderful life for us if we follow him and we obey what he's called us to do. But none of these things, none of these issues warrant us being rude or self-righteous to other people. For example, let's look at Jesus when he was in the midst of loving and caring for people is actually when he received persecution. In Matthew 9, there's two examples. And so in Matthew 9, 1, 9 through 13, Jesus calls Matthew to be a disciple with him. And then he's sitting there eating with tax collectors and sinners. And he says, I came to save sinners and the lost. And then these, these religious leaders begin to fall. They say like, well, you're eating with all these, these people, these, these despicable people. You're a drunk and you're a glutton. And you see that in the middle of Jesus loving on people who needed love, that people began to persecute him and lie about him. And later on in Matthew 9, verses 32 through 34, Jesus goes out and he's healing the sick. He's, doing his, he's performing these mac, r- miraculous miracles, casting out demons. People are getting healed. And the religious leaders come back again. And they say, oh, you're just casting out demons by demons. And so what do we have to learn? We have to learn that The call for you and I is to get busy loving people. Don't go out looking for a fight. If you're going to go out looking for something, go out and look for people who are hurting and who are lost and need the hope of Jesus to go and care for them. And odds are when you do that, one, Jesus is going to be there helping you, but two, you're might, you, people might be upset that you're doing that, or, or people might think less of you, but their opinions don't matter. What matters is what God has called you to do. 
And so what we do is we get busy loving others. And we realize and we understand that persecution and suffering might come as a result of that. But at least we're being faithful to what Jesus has called us to do. And we will be found faithful with him. And so I just want to, for a moment, just cast a vision for what this might look like in our high school ministry. I think it would look like that we would be a community of people who know suffering and we know what it means to live lives that are filled with pain and sin. But we'd also be a people, a community where there is no facades or masks covering up the real us, but that we would be people who would genuinely share and carry our burdens together, that we'd be the kind of people that we would share our pain and our suffering with each other, that we might receive the comfort that other people would give, but also that we'd be the kind of community, the kind of students that we would, at every opportunity that we could get, that we would share the wondrous and amazing and awe-inspiring, faith-giving, life-regenerating love of Christ to a world and to people who desperately need it. And so that's what we're called to in this. That even though we might be people who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, that our inheritance isn't here, but our inheritance is in heaven, and our inheritance is with Christ. And so we can live our lives out audaciously, as the Beatitudes say, living like no one has ever lived before so that people might know a new life in Christ. We can leave it all in the playing field, knowing that our reward is in heaven. I pray that this sermon is encouraging to you today and that it would uh, encourage you to greater faith in Jesus. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you guys next week.